Hello, everybody. I'm Kim Wright. I'm one of the members of uh, Society 2045, and we are here for our Friday Talks. We're collecting visions from around the world, and um, we're creating a positive future for the year 2045. So thank you for joining us. Our guest today is Doug Breitbart. And um, Doug has been a, sort of in my, um, in my sphere of knowing for quite a while, um, but I only got to know him um, in the last few months. And it was kind of, I kind of feel like I've missed out. Uh, <laughs> of course, we, we, we've come together at the perfect time. Uh, but uh, I invited him here today to, uh, to share some of what he has going on. And uh, Doug, can you start out by just giving us some of your background so we can uh, uh, sort of know the path that led you here? I grew up in New York City, and I'm an attorney by training, still a card-carrying member of the New York Bar, um, although I've been practicing unlawyering for the last 15, 20 years. Um, usually um, representing all the parties, preparing them to then go to their lawyers' corners and neutralize their lawyers so that they can actually create what they wanted to. Um, and uh, I had a sojourn in the entertainment industry with some pretty tremendous success in music and in a past life. And out the back end of that sort of um, cross paths with somebody who became a life teacher and started me on um, a, a traverse of personal growth development, sort of reconnecting with me. And um, the culmination of that was uh, the work that I actually started with Fabian. Um, we came together around the question, um, when human beings co-create together, what's the first step? Like, what's the thing that's needed first before anything? And um, after six years, we sort of came up with values. Um, and <clears throat> I crossed paths with Tina um, through an organization called Enlivening Edge. And Enlivening Edge came out of Frederick Leloux's book, Reinventing Organizations and the sort of birth of the Teal Movement. And while there, I crossed paths with Will Vandenwagen, who um, had started a community conversations practice. This is now going back, I want to say, six years, five or six years. And, and I connected with him right at the inception of that. And he, it came out of his desire just to be able to talk to people. No agenda, no goal, no output, no anything, just uh, genuine, connected, um, civilized conversation. And, uh, and it was unique for me, and I found it really powerful in the connection that was established. And um, through several other groups and project-oriented gatherings, I started spending about 35, 40 hours a week in Zoom sessions. This is like well before COVID. <laughs> and really unpacking and trying to learn what the ingredients are for what we've come to call emergent conversation. Um, and um, out of that work with Will on community conversations, uh, an entity was born in parallel to the work with Fabian and the Values Foundation called Being in Systems. And its uh, vision and intention was to restore the beating heart and human being in large work organizations or corporations that were preoccupied and busy with humans doing um, to try to catalyze and reawakening beingness um, and all the dimensions of that. Well, 
Fabian and I had gotten to a Renaissance conceit offering to corporations, a consulting offering around the idea of doing a values audit because every major corporation in the world has values stated somewhere on their website or in their corporate collateral, but all of them are universally out of alignment with them. And we saw it as a way of getting the nose of the camel in the tent to um, infect them with our vision for a viral transformation process um, by, between, and conducted by their own people. However, I also knew if we got our nose in the tent, um, not quite sure I had all the tools that would be valuable to help and support their people to go through that process. And Tina um, let drop work she had been doing based on her um, being a um, avid Buddhist yoga practitioner and devotee of the ancient Chinese wisdom of five elements. And her teacher sort of wrote the book. Contemporarily speaking, she did her PhD on that discipline and, and, and history. And Tina had an entrepreneurial track record in Germany in the fashion industry and had brought her five elements exposure into convergence with her business work and her, both entrepreneurially and in corporate uh, speaking circles and had sort of figured out how to bring the five elements tradition wisdom to ground in a business context. And um, I heard her sort of allude to it with a couple of comments. I was like, is that what I think it is? And it turned out to be. So um, that was about two years ago. And I have been working in service to and studying under her uh, in seeking to bring that work out. Um, and we launched our, our website on that uh, right, right before the new year. Um, and my sort of self-description synthesis of all of this is that, you know, I'm sort of the garage mechanic of organizational development, transformation, spirituality, like all of the disciplines that converge around these things. Um, I've been most interested in what is the simplest, most reduced, basic, fundamental ingredients level of uh, how we co-create together and how we maybe could do us better and differently uh, in service to avoiding going extinct. Thank you. Uh, I have several questions of my own and then we also have questions we ask everyone. I'm gonna save the ones um, for a little while and hopefully we'll we'll get to all of them. Uh, I, I wanted, uh, you know, this is purely selfish on my part because uh, when you said that after six years you figured out the first step was uh, around values. And since so much of my work has to do with that, I wanna hear um, where, you know, why values? Um, and then I also wanna see how the values work and the um, elemental work um, weaves together or if they're two different things. Great. Um, well, we ended up, we sort of did a process of elimination. <laughs> um, we spent 18 months, first of all, um, delanguaging, identifying all the terms in the current industrial work paradigm that we couldn't use because it was so radioactively contaminated with connotation, association, power control authority over, and all sorts of other factors. And so we ended up sort of left with, when we came up with a term for something, what, we were, what were we gonna replace it with that was in an alignment with what we were seeking to reveal? And um, that in getting to the punchline, um, which ended up being values, that we get there in alignment with the values that we would have see brought into the world or manifest in the world. So 
uh, you know, it's one thing to come at it as an intellectual exercise. It's another thing to live it and be it while doing it. <laughs> and, um, and where we ended up was, um, and really the, almost at the inception, but I don't think it was until we got to the far side that we really understood and appreciated what we created. But we set out to write a values manifesto. And the essence of that was before you get to the who, what, where, when, why, before you get to the doing of humans co-creating and collaborating, the values piece, and, and we also sort of contextualized our definition that we're really talking about fundamental ingredients. So it's not values plus things, which is what you see in the world. So values plus a morality or values plus a religion or values plus a political thing, whatever. It was really getting to strip down core values as, a, as an alignment by and between the people co-creating that speaks to the way they are going to relate to each other and the way they're going to create whatever it is they're looking to manifest and bring into the world. And by tackling the values piece first, it's about bringing into alignment the people that are going to be co-creating together and represents sort of one bookend of the co-creation process. And your question was sort of perfect because the other bookend is it comes out of and is connected to the to be elemental vision so when people come together if they're co-creating out of present moment need and emergence which is sort of essential to be elemental stuff we don't bring in the past and the rearview mirror to the present moment and we don't bring in projections into a future that doesn't exist yet into the present moment. It's like the action of co-creation happens in the present moment. That's where reality is whatever the reality is and the need is whatever the need is. And um, the bracketing of that co-creation is alignment of values on one end and alignment on purpose in service to on the other. So um, on the most basic and simple and fundamental level, the whole human being engaged and factored as a co-creator in a collaborative context is a lot more than simply job function or skill or certification or specific task. And in the to be elemental context, creation comes from present moment and we don't really invite any of the old paradigm stuff to the party. So there's not a lot of preoccupation with things that are projected onto the undertaking because everybody has to have those. There isn't a leadership construct. There isn't a governance construct. There aren't all of these fixed structural features that are the sort of endemic to the industrial frame. And the reason for that is because reality is actually a dynamic thing. It's constantly moving, constantly changing, and never repeats. And the only way to co-create and connect in relation to whatever the present moment reality and need is, is by staying as fluid and, and with as much alacrity as the reality that you're actually confronting. So we look at organization as organism, as a living thing comprised of the people that represent it. And it's a really a whole cloth refashioning of how we can orient, operate, and structure collaborations. And it sort of applies works you know, at any scale, 
whether it's a small group or a large multinational, um, the hardening up and the structuring of all the things that are currently part of that world um, is anathema to the rate of change and volume of challenge that all of them are currently confronting. And those structures, those fixed features can't respond and react fast enough. And the industrial frame leaves the human being out. So there are all these dimensions of beingness that are very much part of the generative creative process. And the human beings are related to as units of production. So they're objectified. And um, as living beings, we, it doesn't make us happy. Like we don't like being related to as objects. And um, best laid plans in terms of all of the protocols and practices and all of the projections and metrics of performance, um, human beings, when they're not happy, have a tendency to gum up all those things. And much of that never actually is realized, like it never works. But uh, everybody keeps doing it because you have to. There, there's, there's no way you could get rid of and jettison all of that stuff. And the truth is that if um, people decided, primarily today in the leadership ranks, but it would, it's really required the changes for them to let go of the power control authority over and create the space in the room and the care and support for recovery of their people to step up and grow into their own agency, power, voice, authority, and generative potential. So values is the starting alignment. Like, is everybody in agreement? Are we all aligned? The way we want to treat each other, the way we want to co-create, the way we want to relate to the world, the value we're bringing to the world. And then, okay, what's our purpose? What are we in service to in bringing that value to the world? And in the middle enters Tina's five elements, which provides this fabulous, rich language and vision for how to um, diagnose and identify what's needed on a human energetic flow level um, to get everybody in alignment and in coherence with each other. Thank you. I'm going to start asking the, the standard questions now. Uh, so what is your vision for 2045? Well, so, so I, I've got um, a couple of different facets in response to this, and I've been stewing on it for the last 24 hours. So, um, so on one orthodoxy level of, of coming from present moment, we don't need no stinking projections. Like projections for me on a core fundamental level are anathema because they're imposed on the present moment at the expense of the present moment for a future that doesn't exist yet and may never come to be. Um, <laughs> another facet of it was so it's 2045. Right here, right now, it's 2045. What does my world look like? Like, what do I want that to reflect? And in that universe, it's human centered. Um, and it is um, rather than fear and scarcity rooted, which is our, our economic paradigm. Uh, it's it's love and abundance centered. Um, so everybody's in service to themselves, each other, the planet, and pulling in the same direction. And it's about um, caring for and serving what's needed um, in service to the collective, in service to everybody. So all the economics, all, all of the 
haves and have nots, the scarcity, the competition is gone. All of the artificial and self-generated scarcities and inequities are gone. Uh, and it's uh, all of us or none of us. And we got one planet to do that on and we take care of that. And, uh, um, and we've got a thriving regenerative world. Um, getting from headed toward an extinction level event like a race car on ethanol to that, you know, what's required um, is figuring out how to catalyze uh, a global awakening bottom up that reconnect, reintroduce people to their humanity uh, and uh, what they have and share in common with others. And the open question is whether we're old enough and mature enough, evolved enough as a species to actually do that or uh, not so much. And uh, <laughs> the planet doesn't care, we'll go away and they'll queue up the next one. So uh, I'm not necessarily vested in the outcome. Um, either of my own work or of that story, I'm most vested in um, how can, you know, what's my ability to contribute value on one drop of billions? You know, what value can I contribute? And how can I serve um, the vision I hold? So as you look out, do you see other movements, projects that share your vision? I, I see a lot. Um, they're not of the media, they're not in the public view in, in a McLuhan-esque kind of way, um, but uh, there's tremendous vitality and energy on a grassroots level. And I think there is, you know, through one lens, we're in this dystopic rush to extinction, but through another lens, um, maybe we're in a birthing process. And, you know, birthing processes are really ugly. Like, <laughs> there's nothing pretty about birthing. It's bloody, it's loud, it's chaotic, um, and it's messy. And, um, and there's all of that. But there's also thousands and thousands of small um, centers of energy, people that have put you know, a stake in the ground and said, um, we're going to tackle this piece, we're going to tackle that piece, we're going to stand this up, stand that up. And, um, and I do, I, you know, I guess I confess to harboring an, an optimist's uh, core, you know, energy that um, those in service to the whole and the good vastly outnumber those that are uh, in service to the dark and the you know forces of evil and um, that uh, the latter can certainly make a lot of noise and draw a lot of attention and whip a lot of stuff up um, but I suspect that um, the people affected by that are susceptible to getting worn out faster, maintaining that level of anger or hatred or fear or whatever drives that, than the people that are working in service to the good, which takes very little energy and is usually energizing. So I vote, I vote for the good guys winning in the long run. <laughs> is there anybody you want to give any particular shout outs to that you think are um, doing particularly good work that we might put on our list of people to interview? Um, certainly, I, I mean, there are individuals that sort of shine for me. Um, I, I can't give you sort of an editorial wrapper for them, um, but I think they carry, they hold a reality grounded, transcendent clarity. 
um, and bring that to their work. Um, and I think um, Dove Sal is one of those people. Um, and um, there, are, there are a few others. I, I, I don't want to risk being misnomering, um, but there are a few others I could, I could certainly give you. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it to the rest for questions and comments, and maybe Tina and Fabian want to jump in. Stuart, your hand is up first. I'm quick on the trigger. Thank you uh, very much, Doug. So the, the, the one simple question that I have is, so what's your intervention look like? I mean, I hear, I hear the, you know, I hear the thinking behind it, um, but I'm curious about, you know, so XYZ Corp says, hey, Doug, this sounds great. Um, we want you. What, do you, what do you do? So um, across three different entities, uh, two of them sharing the same principles, um, we have a whole array of product offerings that were um, carefully constructed to bridge between what our intentions are and what uh, the corporate world uh, wants to feel like when they buy something of a consultative nature. So we've, we've constructed a lot of bridging. Um, the Values Foundation has an offering that we refer to as a values audit. And the transformative power of that starts actually with the contracting process. We have a very, very high bar for them to meet in order to hire us with all sorts of terms and conditions that have nothing to do with us but are designed to protect the team, internal team, that volunteers to initially infect the organization with the initiative. And uh, it starts with a, um, the selection of a team, the contractual securitizing of them in volunteering to do this, that they don't lose anything for doing so, and giving them basically a blank check to any internal resources and answerable to nobody. So they have authority, they have safety. Uh, and then um, they're charged with the audit part, which is um, gathering all of the express explicit value statements that the company has, going out into the marketplace and gathering what the world thinks the values of the company are. And then the third leg of the stool, which is the infection part, is they need to establish a means and mechanism to connect with every employee in the company and canvas and get from them, those that choose to participate, what their experience of the values of the company are. And through that process, they generate a deliverable that again is circulated to everybody in the company and that will reveal the delta between what they've said their values were and what they actually are and will provide a roadmap for starting the process of actually developing values of by all of the employees in the company that are generated and subscribed to by all employees in the company and they become the agents of monitoring and enforcement and alignment, keeping the company on track with that. Um, and so there's a whole extended process that we're actually not the source of. Um, we're the catalyst for triggering, but all of the moving parts and details of how all these pieces are done are by the people in the company. So they create it for themselves as a transformation issue. Great follow uh, follow up. Um, so I, I think I heard you say early on that the purpose is to develop to develop and my words co a collaborative culture. 
so that people can work together? Because I think what you first said was the whole notion of it starts with values to get people to work together well. So how does how does that happen internally in the organization? From okay, here are our values to here's the way we're going to work together. Mm -hmm. Well. The vision in the, in the context of the values audit, once the audit is done, and once an agreement is generated by the people that comprise the organization and subscribed to by them, that's actually instantiated into the enterprise system. So no decision going forward can proceed without being vetted against a rubric it's literally part of the fabric of the company. And if there's legacy activity that's out of alignment, there are people charged with figuring out how to stop it or bring it into alignment. And any new initiatives have to be vetted against the values to determine that they're in alignment as well. So on the, on the other side, the purpose is something that yeah, it applies on an organization-wide level, but it also comes down to a project level. Why are we doing what we're doing? What are we in service to? What need are we looking to meet? And is it values aligned that it's not creating a value at the expense of another one, meaning it's extractive or destructive? And that's the current paradigm. Great. I'm sorry, I have one more question. No, that's okay. <laughs> but but um, and it was just triggered by your response. The the notion of 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 um, and I'm going to almost answer my own question. Um, you know, when people are operating with values, it's usually a, a, a sustainability. You know, comes up and concern for the environment comes up, and so I guess that that's the way those values um, kind of surface in the organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. It's, Thank you. It, it's, you know, it's live it or don't, mm -hmm. but it, if you're out of alignment, at least own that. Like that's our, our, our first call to action, right? Like what's reality, what's truth. And then if you want to turn this to account and, and, you know, our, our thesis is that you unleash massive exponential generative potential when you go down this path. Like there isn't a downside. There's only the downside of the horrendous anxiety of the executives scared to death that, you know, somehow if they're not pulling the levers, the train will go off the tracks or whatever. But the truth of the matter is, you know, give people the space and the opportunity to step into their authority and creativity. And um, you can't project again, why no projections, you can't project what they're going to come up with. The control pieces sort of got to go away. Like you don't know what you're going to get, but uh, generally if it's values aligned and in service to a collective purpose, it's going to be equal to or better than what you got. I love the idea of, of what I heard you say about how carefully you vet people who are going to go through the process and that the whole notion of insulating um, the, the pilot team. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're talking about the way the revolutionaries to heighten contradictions is Regis de Bray. And you've nailed it six ways to Sunday. It's really beautiful. You know, the... Um... Everybody sort of grocks and gets it. But then the really old, wizened, sage veterans go, I actually believe that we're in a very unique moment, courtesy of COVID, but also courtesy of all the old systems, basically having broken down, they're barely standing up. <laughs> <laughs> they're like barely standing up and operating and that the people in the C-suites are terrified and, yeah, at a, and, and at a loss. And, you know, terror isn't my favorite emotion, but when people are in feeling, they're in learning. They're open. 
you got a shot. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, Fabian and I set out um, to do this with really looking to target the biggest, gnarliest multinational that we could find. Because if one of those could be catalyzed into tra transformation to the bright side, it has the most powerful, fastest path to global transformation of any possibility. The <laughs> biggest, most powerful corporations are actually governments. There, there is one company I harbor. I see the hands. I don't want to monopolize. But uh, a friend of mine is, is working for Roche. And the head of Roche came across Teal. And I think there's a familial ownership thing there. And, and he sort of went crazy and said, okay, I'm going to teal the whole company. Which of course, isn't a thing, first of all. And second of all, is playing the, playing the past forward. It's, it's the same old, same old. I think that's and a, a teal of the hun. Right. And exactly. And he, what he, 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 it's great. He proceeded to teal like, you know, the 10, 15% management team and sent them off to their four corners around the world. And of course, the whole thing has been this pressure cooker, this topic nightmare where he pulled all of the anchors and waypoints out of the old system, didn't replace them with anything, did not factor any care or nurturance of the, the, the global employee pool that just had themselves tossed into a meat grinder, yeah. team of 15 people that are like roasting in hell, trying to ride shotgun and marshal this whole thing. And um, what, what to be elemental brings Tina, you know, this friend shared this with us and Tina, you know, in 15 minutes, literally gave a really clear, succinct, crystalline diagnosis of what was needed, because when you work in the elements, it's never taking something away. It's about bringing something in to achieve balance. It's adding, it's never extracting. And, you know, she literally, you know, diagnosed and said, here's the cure to, to deal with this. And so I'm, you know, I've made the ask of the universe. So I'm waiting for it to be long enough, bad enough, and for my friend to get brave enough to say, okay, I'll try to get your nose in the door. <laughs> Matt, you have a question? Yeah, yeah the question I had, uh, besides being terrified in the C-suite, what, what, what what, whatever happens to them, to the executives, stuff like that? It's actually a really wonderful thing. So um, when you take the leadership out, when you take the power control authority over out, they now have a real value add to bring because they become the, the, the nervous system for supporting and, um, and monitoring and helping the flow through the organization by and between all of the part moving and living parts of it. So they're no longer responsible or in an ownership position for results and outcomes and whatever. They're now shifted completely into in service to addressing needs. And are they accepting of that? Well, to be determined, I believe there's going to come a company and we're going to have a shot to, um, to give them the choice. Okay. I don't know, I, but I, I can't help but believe there isn't one really large company out there. You know, over the years that I've followed business, you know, there's always the one company that, you know, when IBM turned itself upside down, reinvented itself. Every, you know, there's always of a time, of an era, a company with a leader that goes, you know, to hell with it. <laughs> we got to do this differently. And I'm hoping to be at the right place at the right time when that moment arrives. Yeah. 
I think it's a lot of other obstacles than setting values and stuff like that. Um, before an established organization, supposed to a brand new one, or one that you buy and and get rid of the old management and stuff like that, like doing is doing. Um, there's a lot of other stuff you have to dismantle, and the hierarchy is the first, the first thing. Dunya, do you have a question? Mark, I'm, I'm holding yours because we're going to run out of time. Sure. Um, apologies for the piano sound. <laughs> My daughter is practicing and I've been like, interrupted many times. I don't think I've been able to be too present uh, today. I'm sorry. Um, but I found this conversation very interesting. Although I'm skeptical about some, some bits, right? And I wanted to get your your thoughts on this. One is um, values, right? When you democratize, let's say, which is, I think is what you're doing, the, uh, the, the values, right? That we want to have as an organization. Um, what I've seen that happens um, is that people choose the values that they want to have that they don't have in the organization. <laughs> so, so um, what is the pain that they're experiencing, then they choose the value to compensate for that pain. And what's challenging about that is that actually they behave completely opposite to the values that they want, right? So that's one, one bit that I'm curious if you've seen the same thing, right? Um, Another has to do a bit with what you already were discussing in regards to managers, right? What about, what about managers? What if they don't embrace the values? Um, how, how do you deal with that? Let me take it in reverse order. So if the values are not personified, and this is really a to be elemental dimension in all this. In, in the old paradigm, everything is personified. You equal that thing. You are that thing. If you were an A student, you're an A person. If you're an F student, you're a failure as a person. All of that kind of imprinting. In the context of this, the values are not possessive. The values are expression of aligned energy held and individually subscribed by every person. The way you get to that is by backing it up to the invitation and the empowerment to invite them to the party, to give them an opportunity to be heard, to participate, and to actually be both of service and of contribution and be acknowledged in that. So it's not a, in the current paradigm, things like this tend to get reduced to cartoon versions. That's why they always fail. This is all real deal. Like every step of this process, every piece of this process is actual each individual being invited, each individual being given the time and the attention and the energy and the priority to say, you are part of this, you are powerful, valuable, and important here. And the, the, the need to realize a success in that is to recognize the amount of time and resource that needs to be provided by the organization to that process. Not in lieu of or instead of, it's not like you can say to a multinational company, stop everything and let's take a year to get everybody on board. But it's not perfunctory either, it has to be real. And the resources and time and allocation of priority and space and the support and counseling and all of those human messy dimensions of, you know, helping people to come back to life need to be provided by the organization for the people that comprise it. 
They have to care for their people. That's the corollary to the letting go of power, control, authority over. You also have to step up and from an empathetic, human, and connected place, recognize that they're people and take care of them, provide. Yeah, I, I experienced it. I've, I've had the luxury of being in an organization in United Biscuits when they went through a, a very similar process to what you described. Maybe, maybe not as spiritual as <laughs> you probably go about it, but very powerful and very successful, okay? Um, and everybody was involved in this values creation. And it, it, it was like this huge wave of energy that, that um, resulted in, in, in a huge um, growth, you know, personal development, financial growth, everything. And then the company was bought. <laughs> End of story. Yeah. That's what I find so sad about the current paradigm. <laughs> well, we would thank Doug very much. And uh, thanks for bringing your posse with you. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we travel in packs. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to share with us today. And uh, uh, we uh, look forward to uh, getting this up and being able to share it with a larger audience. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the questions.